shampoo. Okay? Now, all of you know that when you're going to go down, you're going to go down and clean your carpeting. You go down to the store, you get the machine, and you go in and buy a little thing called shampoo to clean the carpet. And what shampoo does is really it takes the sham out and leaves the poo in. Okay? <laughs> And that's what's been going on through history with black folk. They keep taking the sham out, you see, leaving the poo in. So this morning, we're going to do a little shampooing, okay? And we're going to start off, and we'll show you, take you right through history again, through a second segment of history, and we're going to start dealing with some of the issues about reparation. And everything I tell you <coughs> must be taken in that context if you really, truly are going to understand the nature of reparation. That's the only way you're going to do it. You must understand the nature of it. And what it's saying is this, what I'm saying to you is that reparation is not a nicety. It's not something nice to have for black folk. It is now an absolute necessity. If you do not get reparation soon, black folk, as I told you before, are through. Reparation is not a nicety, it's a necessity. Now, I first wrote my book, Black Labor, White Wealth. That's what I was telling you then. That's, that's been seven years ago. When I wrote the first affirmative action plan in the United States in 1971, that Bush, just Jed Bush just killed in Florida, as you all been reading about in the paper. I wrote that plan in 1971 as reparations for black folk. And nobody was giving anything to black folk for reparations at that time, but it was killed off within six months. It was converted over to, and converted to things for minority, women, children, gay, handed back, midgets, humpbacks, everybody else. <laughs> everybody but black folk. And it was diluted down and black folk got nothing out of it. So affirmative action was dead six months after I put it, on the, put it on the floor. But now they've been given the pretense that somehow they've had affirmative action all these years. And they haven't had anything for black folk. Black folk haven't gotten anything out of affirmative action. And so in a way, I'm glad that affirmative action is now dead. I want them to bury it, you know, and throw flowers, commemorate, and let it go. And I want black folks to go to reparation. Because that's the only way. You've got to have reparations. There's no other choice. You've got to have reparations. And that's what I'm going to be talking about this morning. But also I'm going to try to show you in my little discussion with you is all the things I want you to be aware of, the tricks and the games. That, that's why I'm going to pick a certain part of history to show you the games. And you all take your little notes and try to remember these things. So you see the same games reoccurring all the time. You know what the game is, what they're up to. And so that's what we were talking about, reparations for black folk. Now let's start talking about reparations for black folk. And, it's, and let's, take a, let's pick a point. Let's take Juneteenth, since this is Juneteenth weekend the Juneteenth celebration. Now, I talked to you earlier about the importance of culture. So we have to have Juneteenth as a culture process because we don't have any culture. And so you hear me criticize Juneteenth in a few seconds, it's not because I want you all to disassociate or discontinue celebrating Juneteenth. It's just I want you to do it in the right light and the right tone so you understand what the games are. It's just like if I were to start talking about Kwanzaa right now. I don't want you all not to celebrate Kwanzaa because we have to have culture. We don't have any culture. The culture we used to have, white stole it from you. All your culture has been stolen and exploited by everybody else. See, you, right now, your culture in this country, your major contribution would have been your genius. See, black folk have a genius for creating music, dance, language, slang, you see, art. And even, and, and even the way we wear our clothes, that was our culture. But everybody has taken the exploit and gotten rich off it. Every time you come up with anything, they take it from you because you integrate. You see, one time, Dixieland music was black. You see, jazz was black. Gospel was black. Blues was black. Rhythm and blues, rhythm was black. Now they got your music. That is a $103 billion a year industry, and black folk get less than 1% out of it. You see, even the Hispanics got your music now. They take African music and mix it with black music and call it Latin beat. See, everybody makes money off of black folk. Because when you integrate it, you open yourself up. Integration means filleting yourself, saying, come get whatever you want. And you integrate, they went inside, took everything out, and left you with nothing. And, you went, and that's why you cannot make it under the integration process. Nobody else opens themselves up like I said, come get what you want, take it, and make a, live, make a living off of it. That's why now they have a rock and roll, you know, museum for whites. And called Elvis Presley the king of, of rock or rock and roll, because it used to be rhythm and blues until white folks discovered it. See, they discovered black music like they discovered America. And then what, <laughs> once they discovered it, then, see, then they, <laughs> they became theirs. And we, and we just gave it to them. So, so we got to have culture. 
And if I were talking about Kwanzaa, see, friend, I would tell black folks, so you got to understand that we got to have Kwanzaa. Because Kwanzaa gives us something to celebrate at Christmas other than the white form of, of, of Christmas celebration, celebrating. But Kwanzaa is, comes out of Swahili. And Swahili is a fabricated language. That's not a real language. It's a fabricated language that was created by the initial original slave traders. And that was Arabs. The Arabs started Swahili. They started Swahili intentionally to be able to communicate with, with Africans, black Africans. And that, so that's a fabricated language. So if we talk about we're going to avoid the white man's language and run over to start dealing with Swahili and dealing with the Arab language, so you, you, just, you just jump from the fire into the frying pan. Doesn't make a difference one way or the other. But again, we need the celebration, but you need to understand that. Now, the same thing is true with, 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 with Juneteenth. And see, all this will give you the context for reparations now, so you understand the issues. See, Juneteenth, the same thing. See, Juneteenth started off as a major celebration in Galveston, Texas, in 1865. It's where, when black folk finally got the word, the last ones in the country to get the word, that they were free. You see? And they went out and started celebrating, and we passed it on down, you know, through the South and the Southwest, up to this point, as a major day for celebrating. But in reality, what you're going to find out in a few minutes is that you have never been free. They never gave you your freedom. <coughs> the freedom and what they, and the little game going on behind the whole thing about emancipation and also about Juneteenth. And we're going to figure out what it is. So if we start getting our reparations, we're going to get it the right way. Now, let's go back now. See, let's go back to, to let's take Juneteenth as a kickoff point since this is Juneteenth weekend. If you go back now to, let's say, about, 18, about 1860, when Abraham Lincoln, the so-called great emancipator that you all will be celebrating over Juneteenth, the great emancipator, Abraham Lincoln, President Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln didn't do one single solitary thing positive for black folk. One of the biggest scoundrels and culprits ever lived in terms of black folk. So you start talking about celebrating Juneteenth and Abraham Lincoln, you got to see it should be a deal of double deck. You're back to the shampoo again. See, you're back to, you start talking about great emancipator and, and, and how he freed the slaves, there goes the shampoo. Because you see, and, and, and that's what happened in, 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 the in 1963, when we had the great uh, Martin Luther King march, and I, and I had a dream speech. See, where did they go to give that speech? But at the foot of the great emancipator, Abraham Lincoln. They stood at his feet and said, I got a dream by, with Abraham Lincoln standing behind him. He was one of the biggest scoundrels to black folk on earth. And even when our friends, the uh, um, Farrakhan, they had the Million Man March. You see, because they don't have the truth, they don't know some of the similes they get caught in. So they then go to the foot of the great emancipator and sit at the foot of Abraham Lincoln and give the Million Man March speech. You see, and, and whether, whether, so whether it's Martin Luther King of Farrakhan or our people, we keep getting tricked because we don't understand what's going on. Now, if you go back to 1860, Abraham Lincoln had absolutely no interest in black folk. No interest in black folk. His interest was very, a very simple thing. All he wanted to do, as a matter of fact, every speech he gave in my research shows that what he said is that I can't stand black folk. I don't need black folk. Don't want black folk. And what I would ideally like to do is to recolonize black folk and ship black folk out of the country. I would like to ship them either to Latin America, Central America, or back to Africa just to get rid of them. And see, and that's what he wanted to do in 1860. But you see, he couldn't do it. Because he checked around trying to figure out how he could do it after he became president. He found out something, which is a point that you all got to remember, because we're going to talk about these things later. He found out that white folk needed these black folk they couldn't stand. You see, they needed them. They needed poor black folk, because see, no white person wanted to do the dirty, nasty, dangerous work. So black folk then were needed as a labor class, point one. They needed your labor. The second group that came to Lincoln, the great emancipator that, we've been, that we like to worship in Washington, D.C., was a group of merchants, all the merchants, all over the country. You had people like all the people tied into the textile industry, the cotton industry, the insurance industry, the sugar industry, the, the tobacco industry, the rice industry, the indigo industry. See, all those people came and said, no, you can't get rid of those black folk. Because you see, also, uh, because, because the people like us, 
in the cotton industry, in the leather industry, we need them as consumers. We need them as consumers. We need those blacks that you call darkies as consumers. Because right now, look, we know we got five million of them, and, 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 and I know that, that every year, every, every, every slave owner is gonna buy two pair of clothes for them, a pair of summer clothes and a pair of winter clothes, and, that, and those clothes are made out of what we call, what we call nigger cotton. That's the roughest part of the cotton that nobody else could wear. It's rough, tough, it's just almost so, so rough it takes the skin off the body. But, they made, but that's what they made the clothes off of, so you had whites who had these industries. All they did was make what they called nigger clothes for slaves. They knew they had that market. And the same thing with the leather industry. They knew it from the leather industry that, that, that every slave would get two pair of shoes a year. They would, sell, they would give them a pair of sandals and a pair of brogans. Okay? And so they knew that was, so, they, so, so, so a white leather maker said, hey, I know for a fact I'm going to sell five million pair of sandals and five million pair of brogans every year. That is a built-in lock market. I got black folks as a lock consumer market. So I, got, so I got black folks trapped two ways. One, you see, as I told you a few minutes ago, is because we need their labor. And secondly, we need them as consumers. And that's the only way they reason they send blacks out of the country. They had one other third reason that popped up, and they tried to deal with it through Lincoln, was that the white slave owners said, but on the other hand, they said, don't you know we've invested something like $8 billion that we got more money invested in slaves than we got in all the businesses in, in the United States and all, the, and all levels of government put together. The biggest form of investment in the United States was money invested in slaves. And they didn't want to lose that money. And so what Lincoln did to try to resolve that, he said, well, what I'll do is that let me give you all some reparations. And if I decide to send them out of the country, I'll give you some reparations. So he sent a bill over to Congress to give reparations to white slave owners, saying if you all were free to slaves, I'll give you reparations for it. And the only place they got it was in Washington, D.C., with Washington, D.C. just happened to be the slave capital of the world at that time. And so in Washington, D.C., it went through where they awarded something like $300 for every black slave that was released by a white owner. And that was reparations for whites. Now, now the whole context is set. So, so, so people say, well, the war started now. What are you going to do with all these blacks? So we go from about 1861 to about 1862. Now, that was a, now remember I just told you these points now about they needed blacks for labor and consumer, and they wanted reparations. Remember those three points. Now, here comes 1862. In 1862, we're into a war, and the, and the North is losing the war. The South is beating the devil out of the North. The South is beating the devil out of the North. There was no way that the North could win the war. No way they could win it. They couldn't win it for some very simple facts. Fact one, they couldn't win it because the South had all the wealth. The South had all the wealth. The North did not have any wealth. The North was a poor area of the country. They didn't have any money. Because the slavery, I just told you, you had $8 billion just in black slaves alone. And a white person in the South who owned any slaves had a massive amount of money over Northern. As a matter of fact, a white person in the South who had what we call a gang plantation, we used gang slavery, he had 400 times the wealth of a typical Northern white. A white man in the South with two slaves had more money than the average white male in the North by throwing his family, his home, his car, I mean his wagons, animals, business, anything else, throwing it together. That's where all your wealth was. A black person, a black slave was a walking American express card. Every white person could ma make a living just by having one slave. All they do is put him up in the morning, send him out to work, and go back to bed, wait for him to come home in the evening, and take the money from him and get paid for it. It was called rent a slave. They would they buy slaves and rent them and rent them out to other people up and down the road to use them. So that, so, so everybody understood that 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 was the name of the game, is that you got to have an own black slave. Now, so what we did, so by 18, so, so the, the North couldn't win. So the North said, we got to have a plan. We got to have a plan so that the North could beat the South. Now, see, nobody talks about freeing any slaves. Don't, don't y'all get off on the wrong point. Nobody's talking about freeing any black folk. 
So now we're up to about 1862. All of a sudden, a couple of generals around Lincoln said, look, we're losing this war. We're losing the war. We get the devil beat out of us. What can we do? Lincoln said, I don't know. They said, I'll tell you what, I, we got a scheme. Why don't we play some games, play some trickery? Let's use a little shampoo. What we'll do is, let's turn around and tell, put out the word that you're going to free the slaves. If you put out the word that you're going to free the slaves, what would that do to the South? See, first of all, that would create all kind of havoc for them. Because, you see, the reason they're beating us is because they got five million blacks there on their team in the South. You got five million black slaves in the South that, that are taking care of the white families, taking care of the yards, the garden, the food, the white families, protecting them, feeding them and clothing them and doing all the work while all the white men out fighting the war. Are y'all following me? So, so, so the South is using blacks to build the highways, the bridges, the railroads, to haul, to run the wagons and hold all the supplies, to work in the factories and the mines and the timber yards, to build the bridges, being done by black folk. So that way all the white men in the South would go out and fight the war. So in about September, about September the 22nd, about September the 22nd, uh, 18, about 1862, that Lincoln then announced, announced his intentions of freeing the slaves. He said, I'm going to free the slaves. Let's see what the South would do. And, uh, and then a general said, well, let's, put out, let's not put out anything in writing until we get a major political victory, whether it's Vicksburg or Gettysburg or something. And then we got something really to piggyback on and announce that you're really going to do it. And so that way, and if we go ahead and do it, uh, maybe that will really be a big incentive. So that was in September, about September 22nd, 1862. The word went out. The South was very leery about whether or not the North was going to free these slaves. And so then come uh, about January the 1st, 1863. Uh, he then said, well, what we're going to do is that we're still losing the war, so let's then just wait. And so they decided to wait, so let's wait a few years because they're losing the war. But the generals had picked up the fact that, he's gonna, that he was going to free the slaves. So a guy like, general, like General uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, he's in now fighting in the South. So he says, well, what, well, well I'm going to take that up and, just, and follow through with it. Let's go ahead and do it because I'm a general. I'm fighting down here, not, not the president. I'm fighting. And if we can destroy the South by tricking them and thinking we're going to free the slaves, let's do it. So then he came up with this whole thing about let's take the land, all the confiscated land. And the property from these white plantation owners, that we take over a plantation, let's take it. Now let's take it and divide it up and give 40 acres and a mule to every black. And let's give every black 40 acres a mule. And that way, even, even if Nixon, I mean, even if Lincoln hadn't moved, we could still do something to, to devastate the South emotionally. And so to come to Sherman then says, now I'm every, all the land I take from these white plantation owners, I'm going to give it to black folk. And he goes over and sets, sets aside a, a long strip of land running from Charleston, South Carolina, all the way down to Jacksonville, Florida, and all those islands off the coast there. He says, that's going to belong to black folk. That black folk are going to own all that land from South Carolina all the way down to the top of Florida. And they're going to own all the islands. He says, I'm going to give that to them. And as soon as, he, as soon as he set it up to do it, guess who called him in shortly not after that, maybe a few months or a year after whenever he started, because he saw, maybe about a year after, because a lot of blacks got over there and got the land. A lot of blacks did get on those islands. If you go, and, and no, some of those islands that you all go over there and watch now was like Hilton Head. See, Hilton Head Island was all black. See, black people then got Hilton Head. And, and some of them got guns and said, you ain't going to take nothing from us. And, then, and, and, and also, John's Island became all black. And also, Amelia Island off the, off the coast of Florida, now, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, became all black. But see, nowadays they're no longer black because whites have taken them back now and made them into luxury islands for whites. But, though, but blacks took those islands all up down that coast and took that land under Sherman's order about 40 acres and a mule. And now, about a, few, about a year after that, our esteemed emancip emancipator of black folk jumped in and said, you can't do that. You can't, I, that, that, take back that order and force Sherman to kill the program to not give black folks any land. Your great emancipator, Abraham Lincoln, says that blacks don't get any land. And a lot of blacks already had that land over there, and whites went in and tried to take it away from them later on. So the great emancipator started, started, started whizzing around. 
And that was about, that was about, about 1864 now. Now we come to about 1865. Now what he said, uh, uh, now at this point in time, he's going to put out the, what we call the Emancipation Proclamation. So he put out the Emancipation Proclamation, and, but the Emancipation Proclamation took effect as of January 1, 18, in, in 1863. He expected black folk to come out and celebrate that so he can put, get the South all riled up by the blacks being free, even though he knew black folk, in fact, would not be free. He put that out on January the 1st. But nobody bought into it, and blacks didn't come out and celebrate. Now, did I say 1863? I mean, 1865. That, that, that thing came out, was announced at that time. But here's what happened, though. When the word got out, in 18, in, black folk didn't come out on January 1st because, see, my people won't come out in the wintertime to celebrate anything. <laughs> see, that's too cold. So black folk didn't come out. Black folk didn't come out. So then, so the Emancipation Proclamation then <clears throat> was sort of postponed. It was written for that point in time, enacted at that point in time. The word didn't get down until about May, about May 18th. They picked it up in, 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 where public officials in the South said, blacks are free. And, uh, and most people, so most people got the word in May that black folk were free. It didn't get to Texas, the gathering of Texas, until June 19th that black folk were supposedly free. Now, y'all following that sequence for me? Okay. So all that's been moving across the country, saying that black folk are now free. But let me go back now behind this little game. They did not want to free blacks, as I said to you a few minutes ago. What they wanted to do was to disorganize the South by giving the pretense that somehow black folk were free. So here's what, here's what your good esteemed president, Abraham Lincoln, did. <clears throat> In the Emancipation Proclamation, what he said was this. I now hereby declare all the blacks who are in the Confederacy as slaves as now being free. Now, listen to his logic. <clears throat> He's in the North with the Union, and the South is the Confederacy, and what he says is now all the blacks who are in the Confederacy, on this, uh, the group that's broken away from the United States, y'all are free over there. Now, see, somebody's front light, that porch light was on, but nobody's upstairs at home. Now, now I, I think I get to think the whole world was stupid. If you, in fact, if they've broken away from you and that's your enemy you're fighting, how are you going to free somebody that you don't have any control over? So they had no, no control over those people. So he didn't free anybody in the Confederacy. He did not free that order, the Emancipation Proclamation, did not free any slaves because the, 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 the slaves he was talking about weren't even in the Union up north. They were in the South, so he didn't free them. Now, he could have freed some slaves if he wanted to because we had all these other slave-holding states in the north, the border states, Kentucky, Tennessee, and all the rest of them around in Maryland. But he didn't touch those states. He didn't touch those states. He didn't touch the states that he could have, where he could have freed slaves, he didn't. Where he couldn't free slaves, he gave the pretense that he could. So therefore, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free anybody. And more importantly, if you go back and read the Emancipation Proclamation, also what he did in the Emancipation Proclamation, trying to be slick again as a president, he put in the proclamation that any black people, any black, I mean, I mean, I mean any states or any whites in the slave-holding states, if you decide to come back into the Union, come back in the Union and join us in the North, you can continue to hold your slaves. Now, let me give that to you again, since, since you all probably didn't miss that. I'm going to give it to you again. Also, he had in the proclamation that even though I know, now he didn't say that he, he knew it, but the slaves who were in the South, <laughs> in those southern states, he didn't free them. But he said, though, if, you, if any of you states decide to come back in and rejoin the Union, because my whole intent is to maintain the Union, you can I'll continue to hold your slaves, and that way, the bottom line would have been that whites would have still had slaves in the North and they still had slaves in the South. That was the logic. They didn't free anybody, but it gave the pretense of freeing black folk, and black folk were happy all over the country. Because, see, most of them couldn't read the emancipation problem. They couldn't figure all this out. So they started dancing and singing in the streets that they were free. And in fact, they didn't free not one single black any place 
and gave the, gave the option for those black to those states to come back in and get their slaves back if they wanted them. And that was the came the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, <laughs> let's go up a little faster now. So remember that. That was a shame and gam. Nobody has freed an enslaved. Now here comes the end of the war. The end of the war has come. And uh, at this point in time, since they have been running a game on everybody, and they have not freed any slaves, the first thing you got to do with the Congress is do what? Write what? The, what Constitution Amendment? The 13th Amendment, so they can actually, in reality, free you. So they had to write the 13th Amendment, saying that, invalid, that, that slavery, inv involuntary slavery is outlawed. The only way you can enslave a person is, in fact, what? What is it? If you've been duly convicted of a crime. Now remember that, because that's going to be a very important point now. We start to, that, you, that the, the 13th Amendment says, again, I told you how they trick you and always put in a little clause with the shaman game. So now they write the 13th Amendment. It says black folk are now free. And the 13th Amendment was written exclusively for black folk, even though it didn't say it. It just says that nobody, and then when you, and then when you read the Constitution, you see words like nobody, all, all, everyone. They always use those words whenever they talk to black folk so you can have a paper trail to get out of anything. So, and we got a lot of black leaders in America always use those same ambiguous words. We want everybody to be free. All people should have rights. The only people that didn't have them was black folk. See, they're scared to say black folk. And every time you use that broad, ambiguous word, you're playing that same game you were playing back doing slavery. And I keep telling our black leadership, quit trying to write things and speak broad in broad, ambiguous terms talking about everybody rather than talking about your own people. See, every time you start talking about... <coughs> whenever you start talking about poor folk, multicultural, culture diverse, minorities, you play the game and lost. And see, everybody, they knew that in those days. So then when they wrote the, when they wrote the 13th Amendment, said, now let's, 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 let's cut out, let's do a little more shampooing. Let's write the 13th Amendment. And this time we're going to say that they really, this time really to God, we're really going to free them this time. And they wrote the 13th Amendment. It says that it is now constitutionally put in the Constitution that it's illegal and unconstitutional, unconstitutional for you to commit anybody to involuntary servitude. Then they put a comma and says, except when you've been duly convicted of a crime. And we, you're going to forget how the little game goes again in a few minutes, okay? So that became the 13th Amendment. Now, right after that, what happened was that they found out that most of the states says, hey, that doesn't mean anything. You didn't say black folk in particular. You used all them word alls and everyone. <laughs> and so, and, and, and we don't know what you're talking about. And plus that, since you represent the federal government, if we're the state government, you didn't say who, so as far as we're concerned, I don't care if you're talking about the Emancipation Proclamation or the 13th Amendment, we still own them, still got them. So at that point in time, other pro the Congress stepped in. Now you, got, you had, a, you had a, a few Republicans called Radical Republicans that were committed to black folk, and, and they were very concerned about doing something positive for black folk beyond what the president tried to do, because Lincoln hadn't done anything for them except run a shell and pee game on them, the shampoo. So at that point, that point, those congressmen stepped up. Charles, uh, Congressman Charles Stevens and, uh, I mean, uh, that, uh, Charles Sumner and Thaddeus Stevenson and uh, Congressman Bingman. They said, let's do something positive. And I must tell you up front that the reason those two congressmen in particular, Stevens and Sumner, were very interested in doing something for black folk, both of them had black, had black mistresses, you see. Even though they were white, they had, black, they had black mistresses and black children. So they got up and said, we're going to have to do something for these black folk, you know? And uh, so what, what Stevens got up before the Congress and said, and this is why, again, you got to remember this, when, I, about, when we start talking about reparations in a few seconds, what he says is that you got to do something for black folk, contrary to all this sh shampoo and you've been hearing from the president and everybody else is that black people in America can only be one or two things. Either you're going to be a slave or you're going to be free. You're going to be a slave or you will be free. He says, if you do not redistribute some of the wealth, resources, power, privileges, and, and, and controls to black folks' hands, black folk will always be slaves. Now, this was said before the Congress in 1865. Ch Stevenson and Sumner says, you cannot, you cannot turn black folk loose in this country.
You cannot turn or lose five million black folk. Penniless, broke, no land, no clothes, no food, no animals, no land, no weapons, no tools, and no money, and say they're free. He said, you're running shampoo on them. It will not work. You cannot turn them loose without giving them something. You cannot turn or loose all these black folk without minimally giving them 40 acres, a mule, and $100. He picked up on what Sherman had said, General Sherman had said with the blacks off the island of the East Coast. Is that minimally, if black folk, and he said, until the day comes that you redistribute wealth and resources into these black folks' hands, they will always be slaves. And that was said in 1865. Now, based on that, they then turned around and wrote the first civil rights law in the country. It's called the Civil Rights Act of 1865. They wrote that specifically to be economic development for black folk. And in there they talked about economics. It was economics. It had nothing to do with civil, had nothing to do with social, had nothing to do with voting, had nothing to do with getting along with people, had nothing to do with integration. What it was talking about is you had to redistribute some wealth and resources into the hands of black folk. But now that, now that Lincoln has been assassinated, you get another scoundrel as the president. His name is Andrew Johnson. They knew what reparations was. And what you all need to know what reparations is. So that you won't get confused as things begin to develop because reparations will be the hottest issue in this country from now on. That's what I was prophesying to you all seven years ago. That, that, that reparations will be the hottest issue in this country. Reparations means compensation in the form of money, materials, or labor for injustices committed. That's what reparations mean. So reparations has always been economic justice. That's why my book, Black Labor, White Wealth, A Search for Power and Economic Justice is about. That you're talking about economic justice, you talk about reparations. It means creating a structural economic inequity. So those congressmen understood that. So they asked for the 40 acres and a mule and hundred dollars. And they sent it over to Johnson, who was the new president of the United States, and he vetoed it saying black folk don't need anything, they're now free, quit giving them handouts. And, then, and now they're free, let them live and survive on their own. And they use a term you know, and what says, either let the ends work or starve. Okay? Now at that point in time, they killed the bill. Now these same congressmen came right back again later on that year and wrote the seventh, second Civil Rights Act and that Civil Rights Act again, when it once it got to the, got to the, went through the Congress, it came out, it was called, it then became uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1866. That was the second Civil Rights Act. This time they had to tone it down some. And again, they started working the games and, the other, and, and, and they were losing their power, so they had to start putting in all this all, you all, everybody, everyone, all this broad, ambiguous language again. And they passed, that law, passed the act again. This time they sent it over to Andrew Johnson. And, uh, and they overrode, he tried to veto it again, they overrode him and it went into law. That law is still on the books, it's called the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Now that gave black folk the only thing positive, and that, even that, was, that wasn't that strong, but at least that was the first time they ever got anything that gave them a legal right to do anything, it was the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And following that, they then said, well, we'll take that 18, 1866 act, we're now gonna convert it over to another thing, called the 14th Amendment. And we're going to try to put as much of that in there as possible because nobody still would accept black folk as being free and would do anything for a black. They say, hey, these black folk think they're free. They really think, they still think they're emancipated. They think they're free. Even though we did not give them the 40 acres and the mule, they still think they're free. And say, so wait, we're going to show you how we're going to get them. Let's go back to the 13th Amendment unless we got them again. Well, the 13th Amendment says it's unconstitutional to have involuntary servitude except when duly convicted of a crime, they said we got them again because our people know how to play this game, this shampoo. So what they said is now, let's now write laws called the Black Codes in 1867. And the Black Codes will criminalize black folk. And we'll put out, we'll put out all kind of laws to make sure we got them again. So they wrote the, wrote the Black Codes throughout the South and, 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 and a lot of northern areas that forced them. And those Black Codes then says we got you where we want you. Because all we got to do now is put out all these laws, like for instance, that a black person must have a signed contract to work for a white man by January the 1st of every year, or he's going to be arrested for being idle, 
and vagrant. He had to have a contract in his hand that he could not, he could not be, so, so that tied blacks down. They create all kind of laws about, where, about blacks being guilty of looking out of the same window that white folks are looking out of, or having dogs that were barking. And one of the biggest ones that get arrested of black folk for and criminalized them was called um, playing games with white folk. And so, so they, when they started that, now this set up a whole new system of things. They passed those laws. And, and so blacks didn't get the reparations. No reparations come yet because they still got, they still shampooing everything. So now what the North says, the North says, hold it. Yes, the South has passed these black codes, but we're not going to get involved again because right now whites want to re-enslave black folks. Why should we get involved? They said, we got what we want. We fought the Civil War. And all these things I mentioned to you are important now when we start talking about reparations. So watch me now. We fought the Civil War. We didn't fight the Civil War for black folk. We fought the Civil War for, for, for the North. We fought the Civil War so the North could take over the wealth of the South and so they could industrialize and build industries and factories. We fought the war so the North could, could build factories. We fought the war so that we could take the white, take, see whites had control of the Congress. Another thing about the three-fifths of a human being, whites were using that to, t to control the Congress in the United States. By, 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 by counting blacks in the census, but not letting blacks hold in the political office. So whites got the benefit of saying, I represent all those blacks, even though they can't vote. And so whites were controlling the government. So that's, that's what the North was fighting the Civil War for, was to take away the wealth and the control of the South, the power of the South. And, and, and so, so what the North says then is that you all can have those blacks now. If you want to do the black codes, fine, I don't care. They want, they want 40 acres of mule, we're not going to give them any reparations, 40 acres of mule. Um, and so they said, what we need now is some kind of an instrument to make sure that, that, that we need the South to be redeveloped. We've got to redevelop the South, but, 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 we, but we can't do anything to help black folk. And, 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 and we don't want to hurt the North, so how do we do it? And, uh, and people said, well, why, why do you need black folk? They said, well, we still got to have to have black folk to pick this cotton. See, we still got to have somebody to pick the cotton. We still, I told y'all, we still need that black labor. We still need black labor. Yes, they are so-called free on paper, but since we didn't give them the 40 acres of the mule, they're still not free. We still need them. How can we use them? And so they said, we got to create an instrument that will keep black folk and yet give them, and we still need the cotton. So what they did then, they created something called the Freedman's Bureau in 1868. The Freedman's Bureau is what created, later on created all of our black universities. And what they did, they took the Freedman's Bureau and set up a special commission that would go around through the South and supposedly, in quotes, to help black folk. And, they, and the Congress appropriated some money for them. And what they were sort of been doing then was trying to give black folk a little bit of food, a little bit of so-called minimum welfare, and, uh, and to help them, get, and help them prepare to be free. But what they decided to do was to use the Freedman's Bureau in a very slick scheme again to re-enslave black folk. And what they did then is they came up with a whole scheme saying we still need black folks labor. So the Freedman's Bureau then set up a thing called a contract system where they drew up a little contract which if a black person signed it, it tied him to the first spot. See, nobody put his name in the first spot with an X and tied him into the white man at the South. Okay? And the Freedman's Bureau went all throughout the South said they're going to do it in such a way where the white, because the whites in the north needed cotton. Still needed cotton. They, 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 they take, even though they destroyed the south, they moved all those factories and all the cotton from the south to the north. And now the north got all the plants in the south, and they needed factories. At that point in time, in the eight, late 1860s, in the late 1860s, over 60% of all this country's export and wealth was in cotton. They were still shipping cotton out. And they need to sell cotton because like, like, like England was buying something like one billion pounds a year. And they needed that cotton, but they didn't, and, and they could have solved, they could have solved a racial problem at that point in time by just simply saying, if we take, if we need cotton and we need cotton production, why don't we get a 40 acres and a mule to the black people and let them raise the cotton and buy it from them? You know, if, if the country needs cotton to survive because that's our major industry, why don't we give land mules and money to black folk, let them raise the cotton and buy it from them. And see, the racism in this country was so acute and so strong 
They said, don't give them anything. What you do is to go around and sign up the contract and make them work for whites, and we'll buy it from whites. In almost every state in the United States, they passed laws saying that black folk couldn't even raise some of this cotton and, and tobacco. They took the, uh, the Freedman's Bureau in 1868 and said, look, what we're going to do now is that we've got to figure out a way not to give these black folk four days a mule and no reparations. And they said, the Freedman's Bureau said, go get them to sign contract. Because, yes, we can go give black folk four days a mule and still get our cotton, but we don't want black folk to have any wealth and power. No wealth and power for them. So what they did, and after about three years, the Freedman's Bureau went throughout the South, signed up every black person, every black farmer, every black family, to contracts. Those contracts then locked black folk into what you call sharecropping and peonage. Locked them in, and not only did it lock them in, but here's what it did to them, locked them in, but, in those, but what it did when it locked them in, they told them that it was voluntary for black society. But if he couldn't sign, he would get no welfare, no food, nothing else. And once he signed those contracts, he gave away all of his rights again. See, now he, he, he had no right to quit. He had no right to, to protest a contest. He could not strike. He could not demand higher wages. And in that contract, what it told him in the sharecropping was that if you, in fact, would go back and work for your same white master that you used to work for and sign a contract with him, that if you work for him, he'll give you the seeds and the animals. He'll let you use his land. He'll give you the seeds, let you use his horse. But you have to do the work because they needed your labor. And at the end of the year, based on what, how well you produce, you can, either, you can have earned your care during that year, and you might get a profit of any profits that are left over. And guess who kept the books? <laughs> kept the books, and never did black folk ever break a profit. If they never broke a profit, then most of them not only didn't break a profit, but see, and they couldn't protest, but if they talked back, then whites could have them arrested on those black codes for being insolent and talking back to white folk. And then after once they did that, he was criminalized. Then he could, didn't have to pay him anything. And so when that happened, by, so by 1869, 1870, most of these blacks were frozen all across the South again, locked back into slavery. And the United States government had participated in it again. Participated in all these corporations. And they, and they, wouldn't, and they wouldn't give black folk land, or even the simple 40 acres and a mule. And keeping in mind that in 1862, the last Homestead Act was passed in the United States. The last Homestead Act was passed in 1862, which means all those 11 million white immigrants I told you about a few minutes ago started coming in between 1865 and 1880, and then the other 26 million that came in to the end of the year. All of them came in here to get land while they were running the shampoo on black folk. Running the shampoo game on black folk. As a matter of fact, in that period, in that period between 1862, between 1862 and the turn of the century in 1900, the United States gave away one billion acres of land to whites. And black folk couldn't get an inch. Black folk did not get one inch of that out of one billion acres. As a matter of fact, the United States gave away more land to the United States Railroads by giving them six miles on each side of the railroad across the United States, they gave them more land than there is in the entire state of Texas. And black folk couldn't get an inch for reparations. And you see the game then where they locked black folk back in their labor and slave again, and locked them in. And they needed us for consumers. And that went on. It went on, let me jump up and show you how the game continues. We never got into reparations. And we still weren't free based on, 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 Charles, uh, on uh, Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner's definition. And what they said as two white, con white congressmen back in 1865 is that there's absolutely no way on earth black folk could ever be free and ever be emancipated unless you give them something where they can be in charge of their own lives. And that's never happened. Okay? And that's why if you look back right now, I'm telling you all, when I talked about what the Wall Street Journal said and what the Detroit News said at the outset a few minutes ago and what Alan Greenspan said. 
when you were almost 98% in direct slavery and 2% in indirect slavery. That means that 100% of all the black folk in America were enslaved in 1860. But even then, you had one half of 1% of the nation's wealth. And here you are 140 years later, when you're supposedly 100% free, you still only have one half of 1% of this nation's wealth. How can you sit there and talk about you're free and emancipated and all the game, the shampooing going on? And even in modern day terms, when the, when the white newspapers tell you that the shampoo is going, you still haven't gotten the black leaders right and say, hold on a second, something's wrong. You can't keep tricking my people. As a matter of fact, when we get into reparations, you want, I want you to have these arguments when people start telling you about why they are opposed to reparations for black folk. One of the first things you're going to hear is that we oppose the black to reparations for black folk because we've already paid our dues. We fought the Civil War to free black folk. You didn't fight the Civil War for black folk. As a matter of fact, on the eve of the Civil War, in 1860, they'd already done a survey. They found out something like 99% of all the white people in America were opposed to freeing black slaves. Nobody wanted to free black slaves. 99% of all the whites in America were opposed to freeing slaves. Now, all of a sudden, 150 years later, after the fact, you'll say, well, we fought the war for black folk. You didn't fight the Civil War for black folk. Just like it's the same little game, the same game of shampoo they ran on you after the integration. Now they talk about how, how, how segregation is so bad and how every white person was in favor of integration. When it's even as late as the late, early 1970s. 87% of the black or the white folk in America in, 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 19, in the 1970s were still opposed to integration for black folk in America, saying black folk were moving too fast and wanted too much. You see, every time there's a game, we get the shampoo. They run this same sham and leave the poo in. So now when you start talking about reparations, they can start running these games on you again about we've already paid our dues for fighting. We died and fought to get the free black folk. They didn't die and free the black folk. Black folk are still enslaved. They have never been emancipated. If we're going to get it, we've got to go back now and remember all those principles. They used us as a labor class to get wealth. They got their wealth now. We didn't get any. So we've got to go back and get us a model. Now, what most people keep trying to use as a model, they want to use the Japanese. I don't want to use the Japanese. I want to use the American Indians. Now, why did I pick the American Indians? Because, see, the American Indians were the only group that was stipulated in the Constitution along with us. See, the Japanese weren't even in the country. See, when slavery, when slavery was ending, I did not have one Asian in America in 1840s. I didn't have one Asian or one Hispanic. Not one Asian or one Hispanic in the entire United States in 1840s. So I can't compare with those, but I did have Indians here. And Indians were stipulated in the, in the Constitution along with us. Whenever they talked about black folk, they talked about Indians. But they didn't talk about all Indians. They only talked about those Indians who were not paying taxes. And see, this is very, this is very important. They only talked about Indians who were not paying taxes. Because you see, Indians were also classified, starting in 1870, as being equal to white folk. See, all Indians were, see, Indians were given an option that you were never given. What they wanted the Indians to do was to assimilate and give up some of the land. They can become white. 